Thanks, Gary, for everything you did. A bit of a fluff this morning. I uh, apologise for the audio situation we've got with our streaming, but we're getting it sorted. So thanks, Gary. Haven't said good morning to you yet. Uh, great to see you. Um, if somebody would like to bring us uh, the reading this morning, if they've got their word with them, please, um, at Philippians. We're looking at the book of Philippians, and uh, while we uh, find that, so that, because uh, I'll ask you to, to bring uh, the word for us, um, on our uh, roster, the uh, second reading that we would have, which is the gospel reading, which I'm not preaching out of, uh, is Matthew 28:16, uh, which is uh, often known as the Great Commission, where Jesus says, uh, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. But we already know that one, don't we? So I'm not going to preach on that this morning. Um, we're beginning a, what is it, Neil? Is it an eight-week study? On, I think something like that. Eight-week study on Philippians. And the reason they've chosen Philippians is because um, it's a joyful, joyful book. It's, it's Paul's love letter uh, to the church of Philippi. But I'll give you a little bit of background on Philippians uh, <coughs> simply because uh, the history and what was happening at Philippi uh, is pivotal uh, in, in, in two ways. First of all, to show the breadth of love and compassion <coughs> that God has for his people, which can be all skewed up with the way that humans do things, uh, and also um, helps us put it into context, uh, Philippi and how God works with us to send us to where he needs to send us to. So I've taken this out of a, uh, an encyclopedia, so forgive me if it sounds um, a bit more academic than I would be. So Philippians was written from Rome during Paul's first imprisonment, somewhere around 62 AD. Paul sends the church at Philippi a love letter of thanks, commending them for their liberal giving. They were an extremely generous church, uh, Philippi was. His attitude shows um, all Christians that we're to rejoice in every situation, even in suffering, for Jesus Christ is our example and our, prime, our prize. One of the obvious reasons that Paul wrote this letter to the Philippians was to thank them for their generous offering. He also wanted to commend the unselfishness of Epaphrodites, uh, as well as informing them of his love for them and to inform them of his own personal condition. He wanted to make them aware that Timothy would soon be visiting them and that Epaphroditus would be returning to them as well. Paul also warned them that they would be suffering for the gospel of Christ and that they should be aware and guarded against false doctrines creeping into the church. Paul's joy and love for them clearly shows through in this letter. All of these points I will be sharing with you, or others and others will be sharing with you, as we journey through this love letter over the coming weeks. So what of the city in Philippi? Well, it's mentioned in Acts 16, well, Macedonia is mentioned in Acts 16. Um, read that for yourselves. Philippi was a Roman colony and it was the chief city um, of the Macedonian era. Uh, area. Philippi was originally named after Philip of Macedon, and the people that lived there were Roman citizens, receiving all the favour of Rome. There were very few Jews in Philippi. And there was no synagogue uh, or a place for prayer. Uh, we read in Acts 16 that because of this, because Paul's habit was to go to the synagogue first, but there was no synagogue in Philippi. So what Paul did, praise the Lord that he did this, was he went down to the river to pray. And down at the river was where he met a lady named Lydia. And you can read that for yourselves as well. Now here's where we are so thankful for God's worldview rather than the way we've messed it up. Because not only did Lydia become the first person and more importantly the first female to be baptised in Europe not just in that suburb, I'm talking Europe. Lydia was the first person, the first woman to be baptised in the whole of Europe 
but also, and this would not have been lost on the culture of the time, this massive cultural shift and unheard of, Lydia became one of the leaders of the first European church. And that's huge, that God, unlike humanity, God was the first equal rights per proponent in the whole of history. He didn't. Who was the first person that met the risen Christ? Come on. Mary. So, that should not be lost on us. Paul established the church in Philippi while he was on his second missionary journey just after he had been in Troas and had received the Macedonian call that was talking about before in Acts 16. The church of Philippi was the first to be established in Europe and it had a reputation of being generous for their support of Paul's work. Polycarp, 50 years later, um, commended the church in Philippi for their devotion. Actually, Philippi was a medical city as well and very possibly, they say, where um, St. Luke may have been trained because it was a medical facility. So he may have been trained in Philippi as well. So that's the backstory, anyway, on Philippians. So now let's delve into what the Spirit may be saying to us through the words in this anointed love letter of faith and of intentional authenticity of the first century saints. So who would like to read for us, please, out of Philippians 1, beginning at verse 3 and then finishing at verse 8. Eight. Who would like to do that for us, please? Back at the back, if we've got a microphone for Lynn, please. Our hand held there. Thanks, Lynn. Verse 3 to verse 8, please. Uh, verse 3. I thank God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always. Pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Carry on? Yep. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, for whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And Thanks, this Lynn. Is no, thank okay. you. When I first read that as I was preparing for this, I thought, what an amazing encouragement. We'll still need that because we're going to have more reading in a moment. Thanks, Gary, because we're going to carry on from there. Um, but what an amazing encouragement uh, that letter is. Uh, can you imagine the first time that that letter's read in church and they all go, oh, we love Paul. He was, he was such an encouragement to us. And as I read it, I can imagine Paul sitting in prison and his friends in Philippi come to mind. He's sitting there in the dungeon with the other prisoners and the guards, and we'll come back to them in a minute. But he's sitting there in prison, and then he thinks, oh, those guys in Philippi, they're brilliant. I just love them. He says, I always pray with joy. And I can imagine this huge smile coming over Paul's face. You can almost hear him saying to himself, you know, those folks are just wonderful. They really get it. They understand. They took to the good news of Jesus with such enthusiasm and with passion. You know, he's thinking to himself, this reminds me of that cripple that I healed. And the first time he stood on his feet and the joy that was over his face as he realized that God loved him so much that he could walk now. And also the joy that was on the face of the person who saw a bird for the first time or understood what a tree was because he had been blind all his life and that by grace God had worked through me as I prayed for that guy and the beam on his face 
as he too realized the power there is in Christ by, the, by his spirit and how much God loves him. I can imagine Paul thinking of all those things as he says, I always pray with joy. Just amazing. He said, I can, you know, those saints he's imagining grabbed the truth and then they did something with it. As I read his greeting, I'm actually reading him saying, I love you guys and I'm excited for you and I'm hopeful for you. What an exciting journey you're on. In fact, what an exciting journey we're on together. And isn't that the same, Emma, with Alpha at the moment? Hey? It's an exciting journey that we're on, and it's just wonderful. For those who have been on Alpha, and oh, come on the next one if you haven't. If those who have been on Alpha, to see flowers. In fact, you could be the flower that opens before your very eyes, brings the joy as people discover the reality of Christ in their lives. And this is what Paul is remembering. He reminds them that they're all in it together, that the witness of Jesus and what that has cost them both, but he also wa wants to remind them of what it will bring, that it will bring a closer relationship with Christ, it will bring a closer relationship with each other, and through this, to the community around them. Wow, we hear what the Spirit's saying to the church. It's just amazing. So then we jump into verse nine, and we and and I'll, I'll thanks, but I'll read this part. Is that then we then there's these wonderful words that Paul says. How I'd love someone to be praying this for me. So baby, we'll pray it. Uh, uh, receive this uh, this morning as a prayer for you. And this is my prayer, says Paul in verse nine, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. He's praying that they may grow in their faith and grow in their witness to the point where they will know the right God view from the wrong world view. I'll repeat that again. That their faith and their knowledge of Christ would become so strong and so real that they would know the difference between the right God view and the wrong world view. And then they lived it. They showed the community around them a viable and sustainable alternative way to live instead of the lonely, separated, hopeless and fearful world that they were living in and that our communities still live in to this day. They showed the community around them a viable and sustainable alternative way to live. And it got to the point where they became so Jesus-centered that people saw something different in them. Something that I'd been praying for that would become so attractive and appealing that it drew people to Christ. And from there, their witness became such an accurate, authentic portrayal of Christianity that it changed the world. What a powerful, encouraging, and missional prayer of Paul's, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may, may be able to discern what is best. Amazing prayer. But Paul didn't simply say, keep doing what I've told you to do. He didn't say that. He didn't say to them, so I've given you the lesson, you're on your own, away you go, make sure you keep doing it. What he said was, that he what he reminds them of and shares with them, 
that he still shares his testimony at every opportunity. In fact, he tells them that the messier the situation, the more influential he has become. Let's picture this for a moment. Journey with me back to Philippi, uh, to Rome, back in the first century. Paul's in prison. And the main reason that he's in prison is because he won't shut up talking about Jesus. They wanted to close him down. And so they trumped up a whole lot of stuff. And then because he's a Roman citizen, he demanded that he could, uh, that he could bring his case before uh, the emperor, which was his right to do so. What an amazing journey. He was able to witness to all these people along the way. So what happens is that, uh, remember, we're not dealing with flesh and blood. We're dealing with principalities and powers. So what's happened here is that the enemy, the devil, has tried to shut Paul down. And so Paul ends up in prison. Well, there goes his opportunity to witness, doesn't it? There goes his opportunity to stand on a street corner with a sandwich board saying the end is nigh. There goes his opportunity to go from door to door, but not our Paul. Paul gets put in prison for sharing the Jesus story. But that doesn't stop him. He ends up sharing with the guards and with the other prisoners. He's not wallowing in despair that God has shut him up in a prison cell away from the community. He took every opportunity. And why did he take every opportunity? Because he recognised that everyone matters to God. Everyone needs the good news, the hope and the promise that can only come from Christ. No less valuable for this day and for this community. He then goes on to talk of how, uh, as a result, he says in verse 13, it's become clear throughout the whole palace garden to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. They knew that he was a Christian. And he says, and because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim their gospel without fear. So they were so in, uh, um, impressed that even though Paul was in chains and still sharing the gospel, that encouraged them as they learnt from him to do the same. He also then goes on to say that some of them were doing it not out of love, but they were doing it out of selfish ambition. That um, some of them were doing it out of envy and some of them were doing it to be one-upmanship on Paul. But I had to read this a number of times because he says in there that, but what does that matter? And I thought, well, hold on a second, wrong doctrine, all sorts of things could come into that. Paul says it doesn't matter. The important thing, whether it be a false motive or, or a true motive, the important thing is that Christ is preached. And I fought and, 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 and I read that, I don't know how many times trying to get my head around it because it didn't seem to make sense to me. Because if somebody is, is preaching uh, a false gospel, um, they need to be shut down. But that's not what Paul's saying. So I read it a number of times. And Paul's not concerned at the motivation. He's, confirmed, he's more concerned if people didn't share. And it didn't make sense to me at all. And then God gave me, uh, reminded me of a story. Who here has heard of Jim and Tammy Baker. Who, who's heard of Jim and Tammy Baker? Okay. Um, as soon as I mention uh, what they did, you will remember them. Jim and Tammy Baker were the first, really, weren't they, Daryl? They were the first big American televangelists. They were huge. Like, they, at one stage, they, they said that um, uh, for $1,000 they would give people a certificate of uh, that they would have a permanent, I think it was a month, they had a permanent month a year in this really high-class five-star accommodation somewhere in Florida. Um, and it was a $1,000 donation. He had 6,000 people, uh, sorry, 60,000 people Applied. He made $62 million off that one cry 
for a donation. Obviously, he, he couldn't. Um, and so that was the impact that this guy had. So Jim and Tammy Baker, uh, they ended up uh, in prison. Um, he got done for, or both of them, uh, for fraud. Um, and uh, he ended up having a, an affair. Um, and he got done for fraud and ended up in prison. In 1994, John Be uh, Bevere visited Jim Baker while he was in prison. And this is part of the conversation that they had. This is just part of it. So this is now the interviewer talking about Jim Baker. After he, Jim Baker, had talked for a while, I felt like I wanted to ask him some questions. The first question I asked him was, Jim, when did you fall out of love with Jesus? When did you stop loving Jesus? Was it when you committed adultery with Jessica Hahn seven years before you got thrown into prison? Was it during all the fraud when did it really happen? He goes on to say, because I remember he was so on fire for God in the early years. But then Jim looked at me and said, John, I didn't. I said to him, what do you mean you didn't? And Jim said, I didn't fall out of love with Jesus. I loved him all the way through it. But then he saw a total bewilderment on my face. I said, what do you mean? You still loved Jesus during all those times of adultery and fraud? And Jim said, John, I loved Jesus, but I no longer feared God. I loved Jesus, but I no longer feared God. There are millions of Christians in America who love Jesus but don't fear him. And it is the fear, or respect is a better word, it is the fear of the Lord that perfects holiness in our lives. Jim and Tammy Baker, as errant as they were, had a ministry that even through all its mess and its greed still brought people to Jesus. Never underestimate that. The ministry is the Lord's. They're going to have to stand before God and explain what they did with that ministry. But the ministry is the Lord's. People still came to faith. Paul reminds us that it is the gospel that will succeed. That's why, I'm getting off script now, that's why, and for those who have prayed uh, with me will know, that is why I don't want ones and twos and fives to come to faith. My passion is for twenties and forties and eighties to come through our door. Because ones or twos can be a clever sermon or comfortable seats or nice lighting. But twenties and fifties can only be the power of God. And that's what I want to come out of this place. A recognition that God's got this. And he's going to build his church like he promised that he would. And I want to get out of the way of that. So we, like Paul, could do well to remember where our approval and our vindication rate comes from. I've just finished a two-week intensive counselling course with a gentleman named David Riddell. Partly it was for training. So the, the, diocese, the diocese put me through it. Partly it was for training. But saints, I stand before you saying that mostly it was for my own mental wellness. I was not in a good space. And I have discovered through that course where my vindication should be sought. I, for far too many years, sought human approval and would pander to what I thought would bring the approval I thought that I needed. But that, my friends, is all smoke and mirrors. That would 
require me to modify my plans or my actions to get in with who I thought I needed to be on my team. No more. God has a purpose for me. He has a calling on my life. He is an outcome that he designed at the foundation of the earth and he has brought people and situations into my life to ensure that I grow, I learn, I get sorted and I get loved and nurtured. But it's only in his purposes that I see my worth and my success now. I love Anna desperately and I welcome her approval. I love you guys and I welcome the same. But I can't live up to your expectations if it is outside God's expectation of me. Does that make sense? We have a God who is cheering us on and has a, this wonderful plan to give you life and give you life in abundance. He wants the best for you. He wants to build you up and to be lavish with his love. But we need to be in his will. We need to be in his purpose. We need his arms around us to be able to do that, to be able to receive that. That requires us to know his will and to recognize his voice. That's a study for another day. But do you know what I mean? When we get our own way, we get our own results from our own uh, and we get our own rewards from our own resources. Why do we do that? We has a God who has universal resources to give us. Has this, this lavish life us, this opportunity to witness, to give us, and to love us more than we could ever uh, imagine. But we seem to default to want to do things our own way and get our own results. Paul knew that being in Christ was having Christ in him. And if Christ was in him, then who could come against him? Paul recognized that when Christ was in him, nobody could be against him. Nobody. It's like having a big brother with you. Nobody could be against him. In fact, he got so overwhelmed with that that he couldn't help himself but share the good news with anyone who would listen. As I said before, they tried to shut him up. They put him in prison. They dumped him down in the basement. And, they, and, and what did he do? He bought his guards to Christ. Think of that. One minute they're guarding the prisoner, this criminal, and the next minute they're on the same team as him. How does that work? Uh, that doesn't mess with your mind. I don't know what does. Listen to this. And I tried this this morning in my best cockney gruff voice. Ear. Looks like we've got that scumbag religious nut with us now. Lock him up in the basement and we'll make sure he gets his just desserts. And then within days, Paul tells them about Jesus. And look what happens. The guards came to Christ as well. Could you imagine it? The guard goes home from prison. His wife says, how's that scumbag getting on? Well, have I got a story to tell you? And they would share it with him. How can you keep it to yourself? I remember in Alpha they were telling us a story about uh, a young guy who uh, was asked by his vicar, uh, would you like to give your heart to the Lord? And he says, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. He says, if I, uh, I said, I'm a very shy person. He says, if I give my heart to Jesus, I'm be expected to go and tell somebody else about it. And the vicar says, I'll tell you what I'll do. I know God pretty well. He says, how about you give your heart to Jesus, you don't have to tell anybody, you just keep it to yourself, just hold it onto yourself. So the guy thought, well that's cool, I can do that. So he gives his heart to the Lord and the next morning he gets up and goes down and has breakfast and his mum says, how are you doing? And he says, oh, good thanks. He says, oh, so how was your time with the vicar the other night? He says, well, you're not going to believe this. 
and away goes and couldn't help but tell her what, what had happened because it's just that infectious. In, this, in the same way, ladies, when you get engaged, what's the first thing you do when you go to work on morning, uh, in the morning? Oh, it's hot, hot in here, isn't it? You can't help yourself but tell people. So therefore, there, there we go. So we have an exciting few weeks ahead of us as we discover the richness of Paul's ministry in this church in Philippi and how that gathering of believers, that first church in Europe, that was blessed with the first baptised person in Europe and was a woman named Lydia, how much that impacted the area and I would say right through to us today. It's such a great book. Don't miss one episode of this journey. It's going to be wonderful. So let us pray. Father, you sent Jesus to gather us up and to bring us home. And you also sent your spirit so that, like Paul, as we wait for that final journey, we can share the love and grace we've received with those still far off. Thank you for showing how much you have a vulnerable love for us. Your love is so vulnerable that you trust us with the good news of your Son. Your love is so vulnerable that you invite us to partner with you. So Lord, bless every person here with that same excitement, that joy, that desire to be witnesses to all those whom we know. Bless our efforts and give us an opportunity this week to share our story. Also, Lord, could you show us some results from our witness to encourage us? We feel more encouraged when we can see a result. But you already know that. So thank you for loving us the way that you do and for loving us who don't know you yet. Send us to them for your name's sake and for the growing of your kingdom. Amen.